Do you have one question here? And uh, at the time of death, if we do not cling to anything but observe uh, peacefully uh, the in and out breath, no clinging, no becoming, as stated in the dep dependent origination, what will be the result? Is it the end of rebirth? <coughs> Um, well, um, first of all, it's a, it's a very good thing, it's a very healthy thing, actually, to, to uh, um, bring up the, the, um, the inevitability of death regularly. Of course, we don't, we don't know what it will look like. We don't know when it will happen, how it will happen, um, what our body will be like at the time. Um, we don't know if it will be accidental or at the end of a lengthy illness or whether we will, it will be peacefully in our sleep or through some act of violence. Um, we, just, we just don't know. It's, uh, it's an imponder imponderable in a way. We just know that we, 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 we will die. So actually everything that we do in life uh, has, can have some bearing on, on this result. Um, including, of course, what we do in coming to meditation like this, because we're we're trying to establish wholesome causes. We're trying to uh, develop uh, or, or plant seeds, if you like, for um, for peaceful, clear, uh, virtuous mind states. Because this one way of looking at this is that this is um, a good karma, and the results that, that come out of virtue, of goodness, of clarity, of peacefulness, of kindness, the results that come out, uh, come out of all of these wholesome mind states are, are good. They're, they're, they're much more skillful than, than not. And so, um, whether or not uh, what we do here, for instance, will, will uh, definitely result in just the kind of uh, uh, death that we would wish this is this is this is not known but at least we will be we will be paving the way for uh, uh, some kind of uh, betterment <laughs> get some thank you okay So, so if, if, however, we, uh, you're in a situation where, um, you know, you're, you're, um, there, there's illness or there's, there's simply, it's, you're aware that death is approaching because of old age and, and uh, just a great kind of debilitation. And um, then being, uh, um, continuing the process of, of uh, developing clarity and uh, reviewing one's life and being grateful for, um, for friendships and being grateful for opportunities to generate merit and this kind of thing. Anything that can bring some uplift to the mind is good. And in that state of, um, in that state of ease, then, then the mind can go to the breath and it's, it's a, 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 um, there's, more, there's more clarity and peacefulness there. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. All right. Yeah. We can't, we can't say though that this will, will definitely result in, um, in, in, um, in, in one way or another at, at, the, at the time of death itself. But I'm just going to... Um, so what, what, the, what the questioner is, is, is asking here uh, will certainly, if, if your mind was, if you're able to, to bring clarity and peacefulness to the to your uh, awareness and uh, apply that to the in and out breath, this would be a very, very good thing. Not clinging to, to mind states, not uh, dying in a state of uh, worry, not allowing the mind to, to sort of fall into uh, any kind of uh, a dark state, 
a worrisome state or a, 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 um, some sort of gr regretful uh, state, but rather keeping keeping a, a sense of uplift where, wherever it is possible. This is this is bound to uh, have a, a kind of good result. Um, will it will it be the will it be the end of rebirth? Um, it's possible. <laughs> Um, as you as you may know, the uh, the Tibetan tra tradition places um, perhaps even more importance on uh, on um, how it is that we die and, and what occurs uh, after death, and uh, they they see the whole process as a as a, a time potentially for actually gaining liberation. I don't know that the Theravada tradition looks at it in 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 quite such um, exacting uh, uh, terms. But we simply know from uh, dependent origination, from, from the whole nature of causality in Buddhism, that wholesome causes, causes which, are, um, which come from a, a bright, uh, loving, uh, a clear mind, are bound to have good results. But we, we need to think, we need to consider this time as far back from it as we can. So wherever we are in our lives, and it could be a day and a half, it could be 40 years before our eventual death, but if we're, if we're just bringing some sense of uh, uh, joy and, and peace and uh, clarity to, to that eventuality, um, it is going to result in a, a, a fairly clear conditions in which to die, we hope. But um, having, having uh, visited a, a very elderly man just a few days ago, um, uh, the, body, the body has its own way. It knows, it, it knows how to die, but um, we, um, um, we need to be prepared uh, uh, for discomfort and um, confusion and uh, the, the body doing things that we've never maybe felt before. You have a stroke and all of a sudden part of your body doesn't even work. Uh, it's, it's hard to predict these things and therefore it's hard to predict how the mind is going to respond all of a sudden perhaps with fear or with irritation, anger. So um, it's by developing a kind of robust practice, daily practice, regular practice, and practice in the midst of uh, um, busy worldly circumstances that, that the, our spiritual qualities, as I say, become more robust so that we can respond to life in various circumstances because, because uh, it isn't always, it certainly isn't always the case that, that uh, people die uh, with a body that's just uh, in, a, in a state of relative ease and then simply slips away peacefully, not at all. So this is, this is why uh, the practice that we do here and uh, our, our daily dedication to virtue, for instance, to, uh, speaking truthfully and uh, kindly and, and, um, uh, and um, um, uh, clearly in the face of various circumstances, maybe sometimes uh, we have to apply a great deal of patience or forbearance, but um, n not only is the, ex the expression of patience or forbearance uh, tomorrow or whenever a value, but by doing that and by doing it again and again, we're developing, if you like, spiritual muscles. We're becoming more powerful, uh, uh, spiritually speaking, so that um, that sense of forbearance, uh, patience, and ability to be kind and clear and honest uh, when it's perhaps even more difficult to do so, uh, these things, these resources come to our aid when we, uh, when the mind is perhaps uh, uh, very much in need of them, uh, as as the body is failing and and acting in unpredictable ways. So, <clears throat> so we can't we can't say from a distance whether there will be the end of rebirth uh, uh, owing to this, but it will certainly help in. Uh, um, in the process of, of rebirth, and um, that uh, that will be for our long-term benefit. Uh, just being clear about the about the breath as we're dying um, m may not be sufficient to actually bring about the end of end of uh, um, end of all suffering. Uh, if that's what you mean, but but it will. It's it's part of a 
the practice of a, of a true Buddhist practitioner for certain, but it depends on the preconditions, how the, you know, uh, what the quality, the spiritual quality of the heart and mind have been maybe for some time, and the, the kind of clarity into the three characteristics of existence. This is, this is of course, where, where uh, liberating insight occurs, when there's uh, liberating insight into one of, one of the three, yeah, impermanence, suffering or not not self so if if that kind of clarity on the on the inhaling and exhaling of the breath while the while the the uh, diminishment that was occurring during death was sufficient to actually give that insight then then it could could be yes i mean it's it's we're always interested, of course, as, as Theravada Buddhists, in, in what it is that brings about liberation, liberating insight. Sometimes it's easy to be a little bit discouraged because uh, it's um, not an easy process. And um, uh, living around or having some acquaintance with hundreds and thousands of monks and, and having known you know, many, many practitioners in my life, uh, numerically speaking, I, my sense is that um, liberation is, is not so common in this world. So there's that one sense. We have to be, I think, honest about that. On the other hand, um, by following the Eightfold Path as best we can and, and reflecting on it regularly, um, maintaining our virtue, because of course that is the foundation, and then reflecting and, and practicing uh, with regularity and sincerity and, and courage. Uh, we know we're, we're, we're treading the path that the Buddha laid down and it only leads to one place. Yeah, that's, so there has to be a sense of uplift and, and, and there, is, there is true and, and genuine encouragement that can come from that. So it's kind of a middle way, recognizing that it's, um, it is in this world at this time a, a rare thing and yet it is possible because what, what we do is leading in that direction. So um, being realistic, but also uh, spiritually inclined and optimistic is, is, is very good, I think. Okay, I'll start with this one maybe. Uh, if we are mindful about our body during meditation while walking, are we also aware of our surrounding? Does that does that mean we can meditate? Um, um, if, does that mean we can meditate? I don't know if this word doing anything while while driving. There's one word I, I didn't quite get there. Um, yeah, so, so there's, there's kind of what's called clear comprehension. When you're walking, of course, is very different than sitting quietly in a, in a, in a darkened room. While you're walking, you do need to uh, be aware of cracks in the cement and, and uh, people coming and going, and you have to be aware of your environment, obviously. So this is where the quality of um, sampajanya, or clear comprehension, is a little bit more evident. Um, you um, uh, you may be in a, in a space where you if you if you're not careful you could fall down the stairs or something. So um, uh, this is all part of the practice. One of the uh, there are benefits to walking meditation. I should have mentioned, um, including just rousing of energy because it gets the body moving again, and there's a, a flow of energy possible. It's certainly a, an important way to, um, if you want to spend an afternoon, maybe some Sundays you take as a retreat day in your home. Um, 
if you're sitting and walking, you can you can easily basically meditate all day because uh, maybe you can sit for 20 minutes or maybe you can sit for an hour and a half, but at some point you'll need to get up and, and move the body a bit. Well, if you get up slowly and, and uh, uh, mindfully, as I suggested earlier, and then beginning a, beginning a period of uh, walking meditation for an hour or two or, or more, if you like, return to the sitting uh, uh, posture, if that's a kind of relatively unbroken uh, process of meditation, the sitting will will just sort of continue. It's it's very valuable to have this this uh, complement to to the sitting uh, uh, posture. Um, but it's different. It it engages the body in a different way. The energies of the body and um, you, you, mindfulness need to, needs to incorporate more of the environment, obviously, than it does when you're when you're sitting alone in a room. So um, you don't want to zero in too much. You're you're not trying to focus just on the on the with utter precision on on every bone that's moving in your foot or something like that. You have to uh, awareness has to be a little bit more spread as a rule, and it's going to depend on where you're walking, what the circumstances are. Maybe it's in a very very secluded little area in your backyard with no you know no obstacles in that. Well, you can. You, Mindfulness can naturally become a little more focused at that time, or maybe it's with a few other people as we did um, before the meal, and then you know it has to be a little bit more expansive in its uh, in its focus. But yes, uh, I wouldn't say you can meditate while doing anything in the world. Um, it, it depends on what we, how it is that we understand this word meditation. Um, of course, uh, you need to be mindful when you're driving, but um, mindfulness in that case isn't going to be that intense focus. It's going to be uh, um, uh, a kind of a spread out attention where uh, uh, in one moment you're, you're changing, changing gears, so the, there's, the, there's the hand going down to the, to the gear shift. In another moment, the, the eyes go quickly to the speedometer, then back onto the road. Um, you're going to turn a corner, you're coming to an intersection, and, and there's a, a, a brief awareness of the two sides of the intersection. You've got a green light, but you want to make sure that no one is you know, running a red light. I mean, I, I don't have to tell you how much is going on when you're driving, and it isn't like sitting in your meditation uh, cushion right like you are right now listening to my voice. So, but uh, with, with uh, a sharpening of, of mindfulness that's occurring here, you're going to bring it to anything in life. So to take the example of driving, what is less and less likely to be happening while you're driving is while you're doing all the things I just described, you're also kind of worrying about that argument you just had with your boss or your, or your spouse or uh, daydreaming about what you're going to make for dinner or... Um, you know uh, what kind of what kind of clothes you want to buy, or, or maybe you should go shopping, or, or in other words, you're not you're, the mind isn't spinning out into things that are uh, irrelevant to the situation. So it brings it brings the attention in a light and responsible kind of way. You're available for what it is you need to be doing, but it isn't being fragmented and, and distracted by all kinds of things that are not relevant and are in a way kind of dangerous. So uh, mindfulness, uh, it gives us the experience. Yeah, there, there is an experience of, of mindfulness, isn't there? We feel the attention. Somehow we're centered. There's this kind of poise that's available. We do feel it in the body. Even when, you know, the attention is visually out onto the road in the case of driving. But um, this becomes a comfortable state. And it's something that we return to again and again. And as it becomes more um, natural, you might say, we're doing it regularly at home, the mind quickly comes back to it more quickly. Um, some of you li listen to Dhamma talks, yeah? Now, if you've been doing it for some time, and maybe it's a, a monk or a nun or a layperson who uh, you, you always enjoy the sound of their voice, uh, they, they often give very, very good Dhamma talks, and you sit down and you just, you know, you turn the MP3 on. 
hear the sound of their voice and they f- say a few words and all of a sudden the mind, you can feel the mind and heart just kind of settling. There's calm, there's clarity. That's, that's, that's you know, we can say that as a result of a kind of practice. Similarly, uh, if you've meditated perhaps for many years, you just come into a room like this on a, on a Saturday because you're told it's a day retreat and you settle on your cushion and all of a sudden this lovely stillness just begins, begins to develop on its own. It feels natural, but it's because it's practiced. You've done it again and again, and now it's quite normal. It's fairly easy in a way. There's, a, there's an Israeli, I guess he's a scientist named Feldenkrais, who, who started a, a movement regarding uh, a, a body, you know, exercise and health and that. And uh, I think he had some saying about, yeah, when you, when you do this, what it was impossible becomes possible. What was possible becomes easy. And what was easy becomes elegant. See? So that's what we're looking for in meditation, too. You know, at first it's just, it may be just impossible, but you stick with it and it becomes, oh, okay, I guess I can do this <laughs> work sometimes, but, you know, you're grappling with it a bit. Over time, it was, you know, it, it, it is possible and it starts becoming easy at times. And then, of course, with, with masters that, we, that you see coming through Melbourne from time to time, it's obviously elegant. And that's something to aspire to. They, they, just, they just never put a foot wrong, in a sense. They sit down, they stand up, they eat a meal, they, they blow their nose, whatever they're doing, you know, whatever they're doing, it's just, it's just, they're just who they are, right in the moment, and, and uh, they know exactly where they are. The heart's always just where it needs to be, and they say always what they need to say. So it's very inspiring to be around such people. So yes, with, with something like driving, don't, uh, please don't, um, uh, take too uh, uh, focused, uh, uh, don't define meditation in too tight a way, otherwise it could lead you into some, some trouble on the road. Uh, okay, dear Venerable, please explain Vipassana meditation. Blessings of the Triple Gem with gratitude. There's an occasion years ago when, when one of the great monks in, in Thailand that as part of our tradition was, looked like he was dying of a, a very serious heart condition and, and um, members of the Sangha, senior members came and kind of rec- made a formal request that he kind of determined to, to live longer for the benefit of the Sangha. And, and um, he just sort of turned to them, he said, Living, dying, it's, it's all the same. <laughs> he, was just, uh, he was completely at ease with whatever was going to happen. Explain Vipassana meditation. Well, um, explain Vipassana meditation. Vipassana means insight, okay. So you know that we're, we're okay. We're on the same page so far. Um, Vipassana meditation is, is a, um, a way of, of um, treating, a way of understanding, a way of practicing meditation in Buddhism, which in, in a certain sense, and I'll, be, I'll try to qualify this, in a certain sense is um, fairly recent. Uh, it seems to come out of the Burmese tradition sometime in the 19th century for you know, certain historical um, reasons. And uh, over time, the idea of the 10-day the retreat develops. And um, it, it, it treats meditation in a particular way within a culture, Burmese at that time, within a culture, of course, where the, the faculty of faith is already quite strong. So um, the word Vipassana, though, in, in the Buddhist suttas, um, seldom that I know of, ever arises on its own. It's always with samatha, samatha vipassana, calm and insight, insight and calm. So what we, what we, at least the way I learned vipassana meditation, 
when I started out years ago, um, uh, usually I, I, it's probably true, still true, it involves uh, labeling, so rising, falling, or uh, thinking, or uh, feeling, or uh, angering, or uh, something like this, but very much labeling, so putting, affixing verbal labels to what's, what's arising in experience. Um, it has a strong kind of, uh, it, it refers quite often to the analytic, analytic tradition of, of uh, Abhidhamma. Uh, Burma, as you may know, is, is really kind of the stronghold of, of Abhidhamma. It's very, very important and followed in, in Sri Lanka as well. But Burma almost uh, uh, leaves aside to some degree the, the, um, the sutta literature because of its uh, uh, famous uh, focus on, on Abhidhamma. So, um, now I, I, can't, I can't say what various Vipassana teachers, how they uh, approach this subject nowadays, but, but it, for the first, I don't know, uh, 15 years that I was meditating, it was always in a fairly strong uh, kind of Vipassana style. Now, I'm not sure if this is what even the person writing this question is kind of understands by this. But, and, and perhaps this tradition has changed a bit in, in the West in recent years. But typically, Vipassana meditation involves, yeah, labeling, um, walking and sitting meditation, and doing many of the things that we, we uh, uh, do here. But there, are, there is certain emphasis around um, uh, labeling. Um, the Goenka tradition, I think, would, would describe itself as as uh, a Vipassana tradition, and I think walking meditation isn't really even part of that tradition, so that's a, a difference there. In, um, in, the, in the Thai forest tradition, meditation takes on a little different uh, character, and one thing we could say about it is that uh, uh, definitely Vipassana alone is you know, no one would really follow that or really uh, understand what you meant necessarily, because they 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 very much see meditation as a as a combination of uh, vipassana samatha, calm and insight, and so many of the forest masters will uh, be understood to have um, very uh, uh, strong abilities in jhana, for example. Um, in the in the vipassana tradition, uh, it 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 can be the it can be the case that jhana, the that is the the, um, the cultivation of deep states of absorption, and uh, typically we think of, of four of the first four jhanas that the Buddha spoke about. So deep deep states of absorption. Uh, and uh, in, in Vipassana training, sometimes these will be avoided. These, uh, the, the cultivation of calm will be, will be uh, uh, explicitly not the focus. And they'll give reasons for, for, for this. They, uh, they will say, they can say that um, calm can lead to uh, attachment. We get attached to calm states of mind. Um, try to be sort of delicate here or, or politic. I mean, first of all, I, I'm just speaking personally now. Um, so the first 15, my, my early teachers all seemed to, almost all of them, I think I had a retreat with, with uh, Sister Ayakema many years ago in the 80s. But uh, um, generally speaking, all of my early teachers, at least this is the tradition they, they were publicly teaching, that is Vipassana. And sometimes they would speak, you know, oh, you have to avoid the jhanas and that. Even though I know perfectly well that two of these teachers uh, had very, very strong, powerful concentration and, and other things. But uh, so I, I, I do kind of uh, at least have had some acquaintance with that, uh, the, the technique and the kind of the way in which the training is spoken about and encouraged. In the in the Thai forest tradition, however, uh, this this is that particular de-emphasis or explicit uh, avoidance, so-called, of jhana, would be would uh, would be held with some puzzlement, at the very least. For one thing, the Buddha uh, he praised it highly. Um, uh, he praised it very highly. For another thing, actual um, the actual experience of jhana 
is, uh, from what I can tell, speaking with many monks and, and that, and hearing what many, uh, some uh, very, very um, advanced practitioners say, it's actually very rare. So as my, my first monastic teacher, Ajahn Sona, would sometimes say, <laughs> you know, attaching to the jhana, you know, getting attached to the jhana, you should be so lucky. <laughs> Um, now, jhana is so powerful, uh, so, so profound and so peaceful that um, states of, 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 you know, fairly good samadhi where we begin to, you know, at least approach the experience of jhana, states of fairly good samadhi are in, in themselves can feel so different from anything we've ever felt that A, we can, we can mistake them for jhana, but uh, you, you at least get a taste then, holy mackerel, this is what the mind is capable of? It's, it's quite a revelation. And it's possible then to see how one could get attached to it. But <clears throat> basically in, in the practice that we're, that we're doing here, and perhaps you can, you know, ref, in reflection, bear your own experience to even today will bear this out. When, when mindfulness is being developed, and you know, I keep using this word mindfulness because that's common for us, but when mindfulness is being developed, it's only being developed because at the same time, samadhi is, is being developed. Uh, the stability of mind is how it is that the mind can focus on the breath. And the, f- and the fact that the mind is focusing on, on the movement of the breath, on its rhythms and so forth, uh, that's how the mind is becoming stable. I mean, they, Ajahn Chah would say you, you can't pick up a, you know, you, you pick up a stick and you get both ends of the stick, you know. Samatha, Vipassana, they're, they're just two ends of the stick. You can't get this, you can't pick up the stick off the ground without getting both ends of the stick. So, um, the the distinction and the actually the making of a separate tradition out of vipassana or or for that matter out of samatha is i think to some degree a product of of the modern age and it's helpful at least to uh, not to make a problem of of it and and maybe to de-emphasize their distinctiveness uh, for ourselves just you know just do it as it were watch your breath See what happens. There will be calm and clarity. And calm and clarity are other ways of speaking about the, the arising of, of samatha vipassana. Then in a technical sense, of course, vipassana or insight refers to the, uh, the insight into impermanence, suffering, and not self. So then, then we can speak about uh, these liberating insights arising. But th- they, they occur when the conditions are all there, when everything is just right, when the, when the fruit is ready, it'll drop, you know, from the tree. Um, so this is where, where uh, desire certainly works its way into things. As, as I quoted earlier from Lumpur Samedo, uh, only wisdom can see desire, desire cannot see wisdom. So, uh, insight in a in, insight uh, uh, fully blown, insight proper, it will arise when causes and conditions are all established. That's something we can we can we can be certain of. So then the the terminology then becomes less less insight or vipassana meditation and more the arising of vipassana itself yeah all of that said i mean it, it's uh, it's it's interesting how many of the uh, uh, forest masters, at least that I've had some contact with, they, um, they, they, they don't always tend to use the sort of technical language that we're used to from reading the, the texts, maybe. They speak about meditation in more, almost more naturalistic terms often. 
And um, at least for monastics, uh, say, Ajahn Chah, I mean, that's why he's, he's talking so much about sweeping leaves and, uh, and uh, you know, washing your bowl if you're a monk or just doing things in a mindful way. Uh, the whole day, the conduct of, of, of all of one's duties during the day then become, become mindful, become... become uh, the tone is, is of, of clarity and mindfulness and care, respect, you know. And all of that is, is just uh, continuing to establish a foundation for, for the meditation that occurs in the sitting cushion. But, but what it is that we do during the day is not somehow just something else. Now, I, I think uh, it's more difficult, I think, in lay life to conceive of your lay life in those terms, driving to work or what have you, waiting for the bus. And yet it can be done. Uh, and and we or you are the ones who who have to inquire into what it is you need to do in your lives, and and see how it is that this kind of practice can 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 feed itself into that life, taking the child to school, you know, stirring the onions on the on the stove, checking the therm you know the, the, the furnace or. All of, the, all of the duties and, and little responsibilities and actions that make up a day. But, but the more familiar you become with what mindfulness feels like, what, what uh, the embodiment uh, of mindfulness feels like, the more it will become obvious to you, that, that the more your practice will speak to you in daily life. How is it that you speak with co-workers? and your spouse? How is it that you take your car to the garage to get and speak to the mechanic to check your brakes? You know? um, we do see this sometimes with people, how they, there's a kind of integrity or seamlessness with them. They just, uh, I mean, um, an elderly man who died just last week and I'll be attending his funeral tomorrow, what his, what his daughter was telling me, uh, ab about him was it, that he just was always, people always liked him, trusted him. He was generous and kind. He was never selfish. He never seemed to be just trying to get more stuff for him or self for the family, but was kind of open handed uh, with neighbors and, you know, I I people that he met. And um, just a, uh, a kind of a quiet mind and a quiet heart and a, a gentleness which. Yeah, it is quite rare, but nevertheless, it shows us that it's it is possible uh, to to conduct oneself like that. But the more so, the more value we place on on this 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 particular kind of practice, the more it can begin to speak to us uh, in in anything that we do in life. And when we go off the rails, we feel it more acutely. Ah, this is more you know. Uh, the life that is being lived and realized slowly through my sitting practice, my, my meditation practice, that's very important. And when I did that and, 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 and felt, you know, felt so bad in response, I know I have to change something here because that wasn't correct. I thought I was right at the time when I said that or what have you, but I know it can't be because I, I felt so, so kind of dirty afterwards or so, so, uh, uh, um, uh, in a state of distress. I need to change something about that because what my meditation practice tells me is something quite different. That, that um, matters of the heart and, and honesty and, and, and um, loving kindness and that, that these are what give true meaning and value to life. So we, we have this measure then. We can make this, we can, we can take uh, stock of our life from day to day and get a sense of where we're in the center of things, where we're on the middle path, where we're kind of on the beam and where we're stepping off or tripping. And these aren't ideas, these are experiences. We know when we feel badly about something, when we're distressed about something, when we regret having said something, done something. Okay, I'm new to Real, oh, real meditation, quote-unquote, because I have been taught by a different 
uh, by different resources to hold a thought, hold a vision, hold a light. Now I'm trying to um, uh, now I'm trying to ready uh, peace and nothingness. Or I may have missed. I may not be reading this right. Stillness of mind is the right thing. Is the right way. Um, and is it right to count my breath as my mind often wanders off? Yes, our minds do wander off, don't they? Darn those minds of ours. Okay, so, um, uh, so this person has started out by kind of holding thoughts, holding visions, holding light. Um, there, are, there are a lot of forms of meditation, it's very true. Even in Buddhism, I mean, the traditional number listed in the Vasudhi Magha is 40. That's, that's quite a few types of meditation. In, 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 in days like this, we, we usually speak about loving kindness and watching your breath and things like this. But there are many, there are many types, and some of them might, might begin to approach things that you've already done. The value, however, to, to uh, watching the breath and, and uh, um, focusing our understanding and our experience around the cultivation of mindfulness is that it's, broadly, it's so broadly applicable in life. Some forms of meditation, for instance, in the Visuddhi Magga or that the Buddha talks about, they, they are done only when you have access to a, a very skilled and um, knowledgeable teacher, experienced teacher. Only you know, in cases of, of celibacy, solitude, silence, you know, they're very refined. Um, and so just because they, for instance, happen to be in a book, it doesn't mean it's a, even a good idea. It's not prudent to, to think that that's where, you're gonna, that's where your practice is going to lie. So um, what, we, what we practice and, 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 and teach in, in occasions like this are broadly applicable, as I say, and Ten years down the road, wherever you begin to uh, 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 practice or experiment a bit with with a form of meditation under a teacher, you're already going to have uh, the resources that that that, that give you uh, some discernment about its value. So, in other words, what it is you've been doing, uh, it may not be uh, of use to you at this time, and it may be that. Uh, um, your understanding of what you're doing wasn't, you know, wasn't quite uh, accurate, but, but um, uh, it won't be necessarily lost. Counting the breath, yeah, so focusing on the breath. There are lots of things you can do with the breath. I, I mentioned things that of interest of the breath. It's length, you know, breathing in long, breathing in short, breathing in short, breathing in out long. Um, uh, the pause, you know, at the top of the breath and the bottom of the breath, the temperature, its texture, these sorts of things, little, little uh, pointers to elicit some interest, purely because the, the breath is normally such a neutral object, something that we don't, we don't look at. So, um, but counting the breath is quite, is quite all right. And as you say, um, the mind does wander. Um, sometimes in particular uh, because we're trying to watch the breath. If you count the breath, um, don't just keep counting ad infinitum. Uh, keep, it, keep it distinct. Rather like when you're walking meditation, you know, you keep a, your walking path a certain length. You don't just sort of wander around because the mind will start wandering around a lot more easily too. So with uh, uh, counting the breath, um, one way of doing it is um, counting uh, one to five, five to one, one to five. So uh, breathing in, one, breathing out, one, breathing in, two, breathing out, two, or breathing in, one, breathing out, two, breathing in, three, breathing in, breathing out, four. Um, and, then, and then returning to one or uh, one to 10 and 10 to one, something like that. So just, I would say, keep it bounded. And um, if, you, if the mind wanders and it could easily do so, you just start again with one. So that's the reminder. When you notice that, that's the reminder. Whoops, <laughs> I didn't even get to five. I'm at, you know, I got to three and I started thinking about getting my brakes checked. Um, so that's, that's the reminder. And it's kind of humbling, of course. Yes, so counting is, is quite all right. Um,
What happens with uh, with with uh, um, words and 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 um, kind of verbal stuff, like for instance, with uh, labeling uh, labeling experience in in that vipassana style I mentioned before, at some point, especially with labeling, at some point it will become clear that the label is something in addition to the experience. So it becomes kind of unnecessary. That said, um, those who have used labeling um, uh, sometimes will find that, you know, the first, for the first 10 minutes of every meditation, say, or you use labeling until you can feel uh, all of the uh, qualities of mindfulness once again aroused, and then you can let the labeling fall away and, and just watch the experience itself. So these, these techniques that, that seem a little bit cumbersome and unnecessary eventually, they can be employed, you know, um, for quite some time with, with real benefit. So we needn't dispense with them and feel like we've graduated, you know. It's always a sense of, of wanting to, to get beyond something and not be a, a beginner all the time. But uh, as Shinryu Suzuki famously said, beginner's mind is, is, a, great, uh, is a great value. Just having that sense of, uh, I'm just a beginner, I'm beginning again. One of my early teachers would always say, just beginning again, beginning again. Not trying to get anywhere. Because the trying itself has, has of course, that, the seed of desire in it. So it's never quite enough. Where we are is never quite enough. We're never quite enough. Not good enough. Not there yet. This isn't good enough. This isn't whatever. There's always that kind of desire. And that desire is different from the, um, the kind of aspiration that we do cultivate in meditation. So you could say spiritual aspiration is, is you say, the desire that will eventually get us to the end of desire. So de even desire itself has to be understood with some skill. Because we wouldn't, you know, you could say, well, isn't there some desire to... to to be better, and isn't there some desire that brings me to uh, to come to a day retreat here at BSV? Yeah, there is, yeah. So it has to be. We have to. We have to develop a kind of refinement in our understanding of what desire is. Okay, that's all I can think of.